Good morning, and it's lovely to be with you. And thank you very much for the invitation to talk at this meeting. I'm going to be discussing today some very new concepts, some are which to do with health, some of which are do with performance. So I hope you enjoy the, the talk. This is an overview of what I'm going to tell you in the next 40 to 45 minutes. I'm going to describe uh, circadian biology because this, for most of you, will be a relatively new topic. I'm then going to look at some of the implications of what happens when we disrupt or mess up our normal circadian rhythms. And I'll be looking at this from both a nutritional perspective and also an athletic perspective. I'll be then taking a, a brief detour and looking at some of the studies which have looked at rodent models and asking the question, can we really extrapolate the results of those studies to humans, particularly in sporting situations? And I think the message there is quite clear that this is perhaps lost in translation. I guess the main part of the talk will focus on some of the nutritional strategies which have been used for both health and more recently athletic performance. And I've used the term chrononutrition to describe that section of the talk. I guess the last quarter will be spent on looking at what we call circadian phenotypes and their impact on athletic performance. And then I'll try and wrap everything up by asking the question, are there some additive effects of when we do certain nutritional practices with circadian biology in mind and certain training practices? And perhaps looking at the time of day of exercise as being an important variable that an athlete could manipulate or at least a person who's looking for health benefits could change to alter their outcomes. So again, a little bit of a history lesson, I guess, and uh, it wasn't that long ago, just in 2017, that the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine was awarded to these three gentlemen, um, and their work mainly concerned looking at the impact of circadian rhythms in certain animal and rodent models. Now, you may ask what's the relevance of this to the human, but I guess one of the most important points was that after the awarding of the Nobel Prize, the research into circadian biology and more recently into the impact of circadian rhythms and the timing of nutrients provision and exercise training has absolutely exploded. So if you were looking at the number of publications uh, in the last decade, there wouldn't be many on circadian biology. But from the onset of awarding of this prize, the field has really taken off. And now circadian biology is a, a very popular and a very hot topic. And hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll see how important uh, circadian biology is to, to just about everything that we do in life. And I guess one guy who uh, I can count as a friend and as a collaborator now is this guy called Sachin Panda. And he works at the Salk Institute in San Diego in California. And he really has popularized the concept of circadian biology. He's written this very useful book called The Circadian Code, and he's done a lot of work, albeit mostly in animals and small uh, rodent models, to show that circadian biology is utmost important in just about every cell in the body. And this is a lay book, which if you are interested uh, in the topic that I'm going to discuss, is a, is a very good read for the lay person. And again, largely on the back of his work, very popular press such as the New York Times and other newspapers around the world have picked up on the notion that certainly when we eat or more to the case, perhaps when we don't eat, this is critical for health. And I make no apologies of talking about some of the health aspects of circadian biology to start with before the athletic uh, ramifications of this, because this is where all the research has largely been undertaken. So let's have a look at some circadian biology, and I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of, of how this all works. So just bear with me for the next few slides, because I think this is very, very important to grasp the concept of how circadian rhythms in the human body are controlled. And I am now talking about the human model rather than any animal models. A complicated side, but uh, not really. 
You've got a big right-hand side picture there of the brain, uh, and in the hypothalamus, we have something called the supracharismatic nucleus, which I'm just going to call the SCN for short. And if you like, you can think of this as, as a mission control. This is the captain of the whole team. It really coordinates everything that's going on in the body. And it does this largely from three main cues. The first one, as you can see on the left-hand side, is the feeding schedule. How many times you eat during the day, how long your fast is between meals, and to some extent also the content of the food that you're ingesting. So feeding schedules is very, very important. Perhaps the most important, however, is the light-dark cycle. And again, those of you who have flown to conferences overseas or for travel to a sporting event will know that you need to get to the event much earlier than planned if it's in a different time zone. And the point here is that when we fly internationally and we fly across time zones, the light-dark cycle is changed dramatically. And one of the best pieces of advice that I always give to athletes when they're training is as soon as you arrive in the location, firstly, switch to the meal pattern that that particular venue has. And more importantly, get out into the sunlight because the sunlight is a main, main, what we call time giver uh, to the central nervous system. Finally, activity patterns are very, very, very important. And again, You've been on long haul flights where you're flying to a venue and you've been sitting for the most part for 8, 10 or in the case of Melbourne to Los Angeles, which I do frequently, 14 hours. Physical activity is very important. So these three cues, the feeding schedule and to some extent the type of food, the light dark cycle and the access to natural sunlight and your physical activity patterns, these are the main what we call time givers. And the German word for that is Zeitgeibers there. These are the main time givers for the central nervous system. Now, although I've said that that's mission control, obviously we can fine tune those cues and signals. And one of the ways that we do this is we also have these peripheral clocks in all the organs that you can see there listed below the brain. And the most important one, because it's largely uh, accounts for 40 or 50 percent of body mass in most individuals is actually skeletal muscle and I think you can see by the virtue of the fact that muscle is such a big organ in any human and the fact that activity is one of the main time givers that the time that we exercise can obviously influence this central nervous system and mission control very profoundly so to sum up the cues are feeding the light dark cycle and physical activity, or in the case of an athlete, their training times. Mission control is the hypothalamus, but this is fine-tuned by all the peripheral organs, and I'm telling you that the main one that does this is the skeletal muscle. And you'll see that has ramifications for, for training time uh, and other aspects that we will discuss shortly. However, those of you who will know, uh, particularly given the recent lockdowns, which we've all been experiencing and, you know, confined to a room, confined to perhaps not doing physical activity, confined indoors and without access to natural sunlight, that circadian rhythms can be massively disrupted. And even though the COVID-19 is something that uh, wasn't in my mind when I put these slides together, certainly we now have access to food 24 hours a day, we work ridiculous hours for the most part. We work around the clock. And of course, if you're a shift worker, you will know that your circadian rhythms are massively disrupted. And we know now from the epidemiological studies that have been done on doctors and mostly nurses that shift workers actually live less than a person who is not doing shift work. So the point here is that the current lifestyle, and I guess with the COVID-19 pandemic, we can add that on top of this, we've really disrupted our internal circadian clocks. So what you might ask, what ramifications do these have? Well, for the most part, they're mostly health related. And as I put a question mark there, you can see that we don't really know that much yet about disrupting circadian rhythms on athletic performance per se. But again, let's go over to the left hand side of the slide. If everything is normal, normal eating patterns, normal physical activity patterns, normal access to sunlight and darkness, you will see there 
that the circadian alignment is shown by these lovely uh, rhythms, the sinusoidal rhythms on the circadian clock there. What happens, however, when we, for example, do not get access to sunlight, or we sleep during the day and not at night, or our food patterns are changed, you can see in the, in the middle panel there, in the red panel, that we have what we call circadian misalignment or circadian disruption. And instead of the waves looking like a nice rhythmic pattern, they're now disrupted or flattened, the amplitude is less, and they've been what we call time phase shifted. So we've shifted everything in a left or right direction. And there's now very good evidence that once we have this circadian misalignment in a chronic sense, not just one day or two days, but over a period of several months or several years, that this condition is associated with many, many adverse outcomes. Disrupted sleep is one of them, obesity, diabetes, perhaps depression, uh, incidence of heart disease is more, some cancers. And most important for the athlete, I think, is uh, along with the sleep at least, is the impaired immune system. So when there is circadian misalignment or circadian disruption, or you disrupted one of the aspects which I've told you are very big cues to keep the circadian clock in its rhythmic pattern, you can see that there are immunosuppressed athletes. And this is very dangerous because the athlete is only fit when they can be healthy. So if we're even looking at an athlete as a, if you like, a whole person, an athlete has to be able to train, but in order to be able to train, they have to be healthy first. So although these are mainly looking at, uh, if you like, chronic disease states, I think it's very important to stress that the athlete there at the bottom is also very, very important. And the athlete, again, has to be healthy before they're enabled to train to be an athlete. So this circadian disruption, or circadian misalignment it is a very important aspect now. I'm just going to dwell very quickly uh, on the fact that some of the studies, or indeed the majority of the studies so far, looking at circadian biology and circadian rhythms, have largely been conducted in rodents, uh, in rats or mice. And I think we need to be careful about translating some of these results to humans. A lot of the popular press has has leapt on the bandwagon of some of these animal studies with very little regard to the fact that, you know, uh, as the next slide says, humans are not 80 kilogram mice. And if, no offense if you're American, but the average weight of the Americans is, is much larger than the Europeans and certainly probably much larger than the average Malaysian. So um, the point here is that humans are not large mice. And we've published a, a study on this recently, or at least a review article, and you can see uh, every time I use a slide, hopefully there's a reference that you can go and read. And I'd just like to outline some of the interspecies differences between uh, man, in this case, and rodents. And that could be a mouse or it could be a rat. And you really, really need to bear these in mind if you're reading papers on circadian biology, which make fairly generalized statements about the best time of day to exercise or the best time to train or the best time to eat because these are done for the most part in animals and i'll tell you now why you have to be very 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 careful let's start at the bottom there with feeding if you give a rat food they will eat it all in one sitting they will sit down and they will pretty much eat everything that you put in their cage at one sitting the human doesn't do that the human on the right hand side normally has three meals per day and we'll go back to this when we look at the feeding patterns of humans and it's spread throughout perhaps a 12 hour eating window. That is vastly different to the animal. Now that has massive implications for how we store substrates, particularly carbohydrates and fats. And that is very important when it comes to athletic performance. So that's one major difference. The major difference, of course, if you look at the moonlight versus the sunlight there, is that uh, rodents are nocturnal and mice are very, very active during their dark phase. Now, I don't know too many humans who get up and exercise in the dark, so there are massive differences there between the animal model and the human. If you look at the person on the right-hand side there, they're sitting in an armchair because humans tend to actively choose to be inactive. Whereas the rat, if you put 
uh, a treadmill or a running wheel in its cage, they will often cover 10 to 15 kilometers per day. I don't know many non-athletes who choose to voluntarily walk or run, cycle or do anything for 15 kilometers a day unless they're an athlete. So again, massive differences. The main one though, as far as I'm concerned as an exercise physiologist and nutritionist, is that if you're an animal, you rely when you're exercising on substrates which are circulating in the bloodstream, namely free fatty acids and glucose. You do not rely to a large extent on substrates stored within the muscle, such as intramuscular triglycerides and muscle glycogen. Now contrast that with the human. We know from our studies, and many of you in the audience will have done this and know this already, but any time we exercise at an intensity above 50 or 60% of VO2 max, we're using largely intramuscular substrates. We use a large amount of muscle fat and muscle carbohydrates in the form of triglycerides and glycogen. So these are major, major interspecies differences. And again, I just issue a warning when you are reading some of these studies in the literature and you are reading some of the popular press out there, and we're bombarded with this all the time, messages about the timing of exercise, the timing of food. A large proportion of these studies have been done in animals, and I'm not sure that we can interpret those results directly to the human. So that's just a caveat as we go forward. So let's have a look now at the main part of the talk, this aspect of what we call chrononutrition. And again, this is a relatively new term. Uh, only in the last few years have we, have we come up with this. And it really means the timing of nutrient intake. That's all chrononutrition means. But there are various ways which we can manipulate that. And I will discuss some of those as we go through the talk. So as you saw in the first couple of slides, the timing of food, not so much the type of food, but the timing of food throughout the day is a very powerful, what we call Zeitgeber or time giver. And the interesting thing now is if you look at dietary recommendations, be that in, in your country, in Malaysia, be that here in Australia, be it in the US or Canada or Europe, none of the current dietary guidelines actually have any mention of the timing of food, which is really interesting. And I think in the next guidelines will change dramatically next time uh, nations revise their national guidelines. So at the moment, nutritional guidelines for health, for the most part, it very rarely mentions athletic performance, but for the general population and for health, they tell you, if you like, how much you should be eating, in other words, the energy that you should be taking in, in a day. They tell you largely to avoid certain foods and to eat more of other type of foods, in other words, the macronutrient distribution, but they actually tell you nothing about the time to eat food. So this is a really glaring omission, and I think given the massive amount of literature which we now have, as I say, largely in rodents, but more recently a lot more in humans, that next time national dietary guidelines are written, there will be absolutely reference to the timing of food intake, because we now know that along with what you eat, the timing of food intake may be as important and perhaps even more important. So here's an exercise for you all to do while you're either sitting at home or wherever you are listening to this lecture. I want you to think about your average day. Don't do a weekend because typically those of you who work in the nutrition field will know that uh, whether you're an athlete or whether you're a person uh, who just exercises for fitness, that you eat differently at the weekends. So just think of your typical weekday. Think of the time of your first energy intake, usually your breakfast, hopefully, and think about what time you have your breakfast. Okay, you've written that down. Now think about your last nutrient intake of the day. I don't mean your evening meal, I mean that little snack that you might have just before breakfast, that chocolate, that ice cream, maybe that glass of beer or, or wine or whatever it happens to be, that's still energy intake. Think of that time and then look at the time window over which you have eaten. In other words, what is the difference between the first intake 
and the last energy intake. Now I'm going to tell you now, if it's 14 hours or over, <laughs> you're in big trouble. That's a very, very unhealthy eating pattern. If it's eight or nine hours or under, you're very, very diligent and very, very uh, regimented in your eating. And that may be a very, very good thing. Generally, most people tend towards around a 12 hour cycle. That is the duration between your first eating opportunity and your last eating opportunity. Now, that's what we call the feeding fasting cycle. The feeding cycle is eight to 10 hours or eight to 12 hours, whichever yours happens to be. And the fasting cycle is the difference. And typically, you know, we've got things such as a, an 8-16 pattern, eight hours of an eating window, 16 hours of fasting. And these are the things I'm going to discuss with you now, how we can alter that feeding fasting cycle and some of the implications for mostly health, but perhaps a few for performance. Now, again, if you go into any bookshop or look at the uh, booksellers list, New York Times bestsellers list, incredibly, almost every year there are diet books there. And uh, dieting is, if you like, something which, which drives nutritionists mad because there's always a latest diet. And I've just picked a few here. I could have picked any of hundreds of books that are advertised on Amazon or on whatever website you happen to follow. And there's no question that this whole thing of fasting, intermittent fasting, is a real fad at the moment. You've got medical doctors who, you know, purport to know something about nutrition, but really they don't because they get about two hours of teaching of nutrition in medical school in their six years of training. So you get people who write books who have very little knowledge about these things, but it doesn't stop them writing a book. You've got the eight-hour diet, you've got the fast diet, you've got the five-plus-two diet, which means you eat for five days and fast on two days. Obviously, the permutations are innumerable. You could think of any particular time phase and write a book about it. The point I want to make is that these are, for the most part, fad diets, and for the most part, they haven't been backed up by science. So just beware of things that are in the popular press. Very little research has been done into most of these lay books and these unfortunately are the ones that are the best sellers and the ones that the public largely will pick up and go with so it's very very hard for you as educators scientists coaches health professionals whatever you field you work in to come up against these sort of messages which are, are published in the lay press and then publicized even more and a person comes to you with a preconceived notion of what they should be doing it's very very hard to refute that but there is science out there for what I'm going to talk about, not necessarily for some of these popular books. And this is important, I think, just to um, just to get clear before we start talking about, uh, for the most part, time restricted feeding, which I'm going to. So there are many ways that you can improve health, but for the most part, people are looking to lose weight. And the athlete, for the most part, is no different to this. There aren't many sports where having an excess of body fat, for example, is an advantage in any sport, particularly a weight-bearing sport such as running, for example. So most of these diets are aimed at losing weight. And I would say to you that that is not particularly always the end goal of any diet or energy uh, restriction or anything that we're going to talk about. If you're an athlete, you're concerned about your body composition, namely the ratio of your muscle lean mass to your fat mass. So again, when I go through this, although I'm gonna talk about some of the health benefits to start with, um, really the athlete, it should be no different. And to the lay person, the lay person should be aiming to increase their lean mass and reduce their fat mass. So when athletes tell me their weight, I'm not really interested in body weight. It doesn't tell you anything at all. It just gives you uh, an assessment of their mass uh, really and nothing else. So look, look at the first one chronic energy restriction and you've got these diet books which reduce your daily in energy intake by up to 40 percent so these diets or what they really are is energy restriction uh, protocols have sustained periods of energy restriction you know three months six months in which your daily intake is reduced by as much as 40 percent but usually around 25 percent of calories that you take in the caveat here is that your meal frequency and the timing of your meals remains unchanged. So in lay terms, 
you're just eating less at meal times. The second, if you like, chrononutrition strategy is intermittent fasting. And this is one which has gained a lot of popularity. And it's very, very popular among uh, non-athletes particularly. And, you know, I'll be honest, I don't get it. You know, everyone generally wants to eat food rather than abstain from food. But these intermittent fasting diets vary from, as I showed you in the slide before with the, the picture of the book, five plus two where you eat normally for five days and then fast for two whole days to uh, other days where we have strategies such as one day on, one day off. Now, intermittent fasting is something that we've just studied in athletes because we're particularly worried about one aspect. We know from previous studies that we've done actually in our laboratory that even when you reduce energy intake by 20% of calories per day, you reduce the rate of basal muscle protein synthesis. So normally when you eat, you stimulate rates of muscle protein synthesis, the growing of muscle, particularly when you have a diet which contains adequate or excess protein. What we're interested in, and we haven't got the results yet, we've just finished the study, but now we've gone into lockdown, so we can't get into the lab to analyze the muscle samples, we're concerned that when you do this intermittent fasting, and we used a day on, a day off protocol, that over the course of 10 to 12 days, which is what we measured, that any off day, in other words, any fasting day, you've reduced your rates of muscle protein synthesis. Now for an athlete, that's a very, very, very bad thing. But it's also very bad for the man or woman in the street who is trying to get healthy and lose weight, because in that case, it's muscle mass that you're losing. So we're very concerned about some of these intermittent fasting diets and perhaps the effect that they have on skeletal muscle, which, as I showed you earlier, is a very important tissue, not just for glucose disposal uh, and everything else and controlling your glycemia during the day, but also for, for thermoregulation, for movement, for activity, and, of course, for performance. So the intermittent fasting question, uh, hopefully we'll get back into the lab soon and be, be able to answer that question. But our hypothesis was that any time you fast for a day, 24 hours or 36 hours, you would reduce your rates of muscle protein synthesis. And I think you, you can see that over time, this will be a very bad thing. Maybe you reduce them by a very small amount each day. But if you fast for 30 or 40 days over the year, which is very, very common for some of these diets, in fact, they're usually twice that, then you can see that gradually you lose muscle. You're just chipping away at skeletal muscle all the time. I'm not big on those first two, as you can probably guess from my comments, but I think one thing that is very important and is very, very popular at the moment, and I do think uh, will be included in some of the dietary recommendations soon for perhaps just the general population, but perhaps also for certain groups of athletes, is this time-restricted feeding or time-restricted eating. So this is where you eat food throughout the day, but you eat it during a set window. And let's go back to when I asked you what your time window of eating was. And I said, if you're, if you're up to 14 hours, you're probably in big trouble and should think about adjusting your diet. We typically try and say to, to our non-athletic populations, for the most part, try and restrict that eating window to eight to 10 hours per day. The closer you can get to eight, the better, but that's not sort of set in stone. So Time-restricted feeding refers to when people eat the same amount of food, but they just eat it over a shorter window. And this is the big message that I think is very, very important. We're not telling you to cut out carbohydrates, fat, ice cream, beer, whatever it is. We're just saying whatever you eat, eat it over a smaller time window. Now, as you see from the studies, when you tell people to do that, because they're used to eating over 12 hours, and now they can over, uh, only eat under conditions of eight hours, for example, they tend not to eat as much. So in, it is, in effect, starting to become a little bit of an energy-restricted diet, but not in all the studies, that's for sure. So you may be asking yourself, well, prolonged fasting and time-restricted eating, aren't they the same thing? Hasn't he just told us that in prolonged fasting, you know, you have days off and you uh, have this fasting period and then you eat and then you don't eat? Well, no, they're not. During time-restricted feeding, there is always a window of eight to 10 hours during which you are eating. There is never a period of 
24 or 48 hours when you are fasting completely. And the reason for that is, as we said, although the intermittent fasting and the chronic energy restriction are very good at stripping weight per se, in other words, when you get on the scales, there's less of you there, what they do for your muscle mass is very uncertain at the moment. And we think probably is very deleterious for both the lay person and also the athlete. So this is an important point, and you know, this is a sad slide for me. This was actually taken in January this year in, in San Diego in California. And this is a guy called Paolo Sassoni Corsi, who is probably one of the world's leading components of uh, chrono nutrition. And this was taken, as you can see, overlooking uh, the sea there in, in California. And unfortunately, Paolo passed away uh, during the COVID-19 crisis. So this is a uh, and if you like, a very emotional strive because he's one of our collaborators and uh, a leader in this field. So I, I take it as an honor that I've published with him and uh, hopefully we'll do a lot more in this area of work since uh, Paul Paolo passed away. But this is a comment from our review article, which um, <clears throat> again, I wrote with Paolo. It should be emphasized that chronic energy restriction and intermittent fasting, the things that I've just talked about, are not chrononutritive strategies. In other words, they don't pay any attention to the clock. They're just fast for a day, fast for two days, whatever it happens to be. Time-restricted feeding does play on chrononutrition, and I'll show you why in the next couple of studies that I'm going to show you. Again, apologies, this isn't an athletic population, but there are very few studies that have been done on athletic populations. I just want to show you this. Uh, slide and this study because I think this is a very important study and it was the seminal study that launched this concept of, of chrononutrition and time-restricted feeding. They had basically 156 subjects from memory. They were overweight subjects. They gave them a phone app and they asked them to record the times of day which they ate. I'm going to show you what that looks like. This is called a feedogram, which is a, a lovely term here. Here's your subjects, 156 subjects. And you can see from the dark shading that the majority of subjects and every dot represents an energy intake from one of those subjects. You can see from this slide that a lot of the eating was done after midday. And in fact, when they came back and analyzed this data, some 60% of all calories were ingested after 12 o'clock. In other words, there's a systematic bias, as the title of the slide says, towards consuming a large portion of your energy intake later in the day and that may or may not be a good thing as we'll see now from this 156 uh, initial subject pool they took eight subjects and they said okay eight subjects we don't want to do anything as far as recommending what you should eat but we want to tell you when to eat it so what they did in this uh, study was tell eight of these subjects to eat the same amount of food but just try and eat it over a shorter window and by the way, the average window of energy intake here was 14 hours, 14 hours. So they asked the subjects, the small pool of eight subjects, to reduce that to between eight and 10 hours. And here's what happened. Let's have a look at the slide on the left. These are your eight subjects in red and blue, and the red represents the eating window before the intervention took place. So in other words, you can see on the extreme left-hand side of your graph, this subject started eating the red bar at 7 o'clock in the morning and finished just before 10 o'clock. So that's a very large eating window. The investigators then encouraged the subjects to eat the same amount of food, but just over a shorter window. And you can see that in the case of subject number one here, they now started to have breakfast at around about 9 or 9.30, so they've delayed that, but they've also had their last intake of the day at around 7 o'clock rather than 10 o'clock. So they've reduced their window substantially. And you can see that each subject is different. And the question that I'm often asked is, does it make any difference when you have your eight-hour window? Could you start at 12 o'clock midday and finish at 8 o'clock? That's eight hours. Or should you start at, you know, earlier in the morning and finish earlier in the evening? The answer to that is we don't really know. And I think it's an issue of practicality. Um, in other words, if your schedule and your family life and your social kind of wants you to eat between certain hours, but so long as it's eight hours or 10 hours, then I think that's fine. I don't think we have the data yet to answer that question. 
The interesting thing here is if you look at the right hand side uh, of the slide and the bar graph, they did lose weight uh, during the first part of the study there. But the interesting thing is that after one year, they kept it off. So during the uh, intervention period, when they're asked to time restrict feed and they were monitored by the scientists, they lost around, you know, two and a half, three kilos of weight. But the interesting thing is that when the scientists just let them go, these subjects, albeit only eight, actually kept to the time restricted feeding very, very well. And you can see that after a year, they'd still maintain their weight loss, which is very important because most people in these type of studies lose weight and then rebound to at least the same level and sometimes even overshoot. Now, this is of importance not only just to the general public, but I think for athletes as well, because this is often uh, the situation you see with athletes. And when athletes are trying to shed weight or body mass or body fat, to be more correct, before competition, one of the things that the dietitians and nutritionists will say is try and reduce the intake of your discretionary foods. Now, discretionary foods in this case are, are all the ones that we like. You know, you've got your chips, your ice creams, and your chocolates and everything else. And what they found in this study was that because they reduced the eating window, it reduced these, if you like, late night snacking opportunities. And the weight loss was largely attributed to shifting that last meal of the day in from like eight, nine or 10 o'clock to perhaps five, six or seven o'clock, which meant that the discretionary foods, and you can see them all here, the ones that we like, were largely eliminated from the diet. And when we looked back or the researchers in that study looked back, they found out that the discretionary foods or lack of accounted for the majority of the weight loss. So that's a very interesting study and one that we call a proof of concept study. So what are the mechanisms you know, underpinning this? Why is time restricted feeding uh, seemingly at the moment so good? There are certainly no adverse effects of time restricted feeding reported in, in either animal models or the human studies that have been done so far. And it's really because uh, the time-restricted feeding uh, allows the person to, to maintain these daily oscillations in their daily rhythms. And very, very important, the gut microbiota is largely oscillating nicely with these circadian rhythms. And when you restrict food to that 8 to 10 hour window, these oscillations are very regular and very rhythmic. When you extend that eating window out and you eat over 10 15, you know, 15 hours or so, these oscillations are disrupted. And the gut microbiome now seems to be very, very important in talking to other tissues in the body and, as we say, either maintaining or disrupting this uh, circadian pattern. So the gut microbiome is another area of very hot research at, at the moment. Just going to show you very quickly one study which we had published um, actually a couple of weeks ago. And this was a crazy study in that um, I asked my PhD students to, um, to do an amazing study, which was have 24 subjects in the laboratory and keep them there for a day and a night and take muscle biopsies throughout the day and the night. So what we did is we took muscle biopsies every four hours. We had the doctor come in at night uh, with a headlamp on. The subjects were asleep. They did wake up for the most part because those of you who had a muscle biopsy will know that it's something that hurts immensely. But amazingly, subjects were fantastic. We were able to biopsy them through the day and night. Uh, they went back to sleep. Minimum light. We kept the light into uh, very, very small light such that the doctor could see what they were doing because we know that light is a, is a time giver. So we can try, controlled as many things as we could in this study. And I'll let you read about this study. I've just put the next slide up, and it's very complicated, and I'll just give you the take-home message. What we found, we measured a bunch of genes in the muscle, and we also uh, did what we call metabolomics. We looked at a lot of circulating lipids, carbohydrates, and fats. And the interesting thing is that when we time-restricted versus didn't time-restrict these subjects, we were able to alter a whole lot of circulating metabolites, in other words, peripheral things, but the core clock genes remained the same. So it seems that time-restricted feeding doesn't work by disrupting the central clock. In other words, the super charismatic nucleus that I told you, it may act more by uh, peripheral tissues, uh, the liver and skeletal muscle.
And again, this paper's just come out and I've given you the reference there and, and you're free to go and read it. So time-restricted feeding does not alter the, if you like, mission control, but it might fine-tune some of those peripheral tissues such as skeletal muscle. So let's just sum up before we take a look at the, the exercise. And again, this is in our paper, you can read about this. There have been many, many studies now uh, looking at both the effects of time-restricted feeding on both rodents and humans. We're interested for the most part in humans. And if we cut to the chase there, on the left-hand side, you can see that once the feeding window is 12, 14, 15 hours, we lose this rhythmicity, the amplitude of the circadian rhythms is diminished, it's flattened. On the other hand, with a time-restricted eating window, we can see that the amplitude of the oscillation is very, very pronounced, very, very rhythmic. And that's how time-restricted feeding seems to work. It maintains the rhythmicity and the amplitude of these signals that are coming from the central nervous system in the brain and also the peripheral tissues. So let's put it all together. Let's just look at athletic performance. And we know that the timing of exercise throughout the day, again, is a, is a very powerful time giver. And as I did in the uh, previous one on nutrition, I'm just going to ask you what time of the day to exercise. Um, my wife, who you'll be hearing from in a later talk, she gets up in the morning before I even get up. She's on the exercise cycle. The time I've had breakfast, she's finished her training. I cannot train in the morning. I generally train any time after 12 o'clock. And the later in the afternoon, the better for me. And the point there is that people have their own circadian phenotypes. Some people are what we call owls and they exercise later in the day and some people are larks and they exercise early in the morning. Again, I put these two studies up there simply not to discuss in case you want to read them. These are two studies which have a lot of airplay. They're done on animals and they do look at the time of day of exercise and if you're a human who exercises at night and are nocturnal, maybe you want to read these papers. They're very good science, but I'm not sure of their applicability to certainly humans and certainly the athletes. So again, they show that there are very distinct metabolic cycles when animals exercise at certain times of the day. But remember, when animals exercise, their day is our night. So it doesn't really translate to anything that we can look at with a, a valuable insight into humans. This is a, a very nice study, I think, and uh, published a while ago. This is looking at the impact of a circadian phenotype and the time since you wake up on athletic performance. Now, again, just think of what type of person you are. When do you like to exercise? Do you exercise in the morning? Do you exercise midday? Or do you go to the gym or train late at night? Now, of course, if you're a Leeds athlete, you're probably training twice a day and you're probably doing a morning session and an evening session. So that tends to confuse things a little bit. But what they did here is they, they looked at people's phenotypes, if you like, their circadian phenotype, and they're splitting them into an early riser, a mid riser, and a late riser. Now, the first graph there on the top left-hand side shows the performances plotted against uh, the time of day for all the phenotypes. And you can see there that around about 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon is the peak performance. Then they looked at each phenotype specifically, and the top right-hand box there, uh, in the middle, I should say, is the early phenotype. And again, the peak performance happened around 4 o'clock. If you look at the intermediate or the middle phenotype, it shifted slightly. It's just starting to get beyond 4 o'clock, but the most pronounced one is if you're a late phenotype, shown in the bottom right-hand corner there, your peak performance came incredibly late at night, around about 7 or 8 o'clock. Now, as I'll show you in the slides that I'm going to just finish on shortly, that may be a function of when you're competition or when you can practically train. So there are two aspects to this. Firstly, are you an early, mid or late phenotype person? And secondly, when are you forced to train? And the question then becomes, can you change your circadian phenotype if you have to train at a certain time of day? And the answer is probably yes, although this study didn't address that. An interesting thing here on the right is the function of your peak performance as related to how long it is since you woke. So there is now good evidence from this study and others to show that if you are 
competing in a time zone which is not your normal time zone obviously you need to get to the competition venue earlier than one or two days before to acclimatize but secondly the time that you rise and the time that you perform should be a minimum of four to five hours so you can if you like manipulate your sleeping cycle to fit this competition cycle and this is particularly true in events such as swimming where they have heats in the morning and then finals in the evening and that's what we're going to talk about now this is a study which was published a couple of weeks ago so this is very new data hot off the press i've redrawn a lot of the graphs for you because i think um, mine are a lot nicer than theirs on the original paper what i'm going to show you here is they've looked at olympic swim performances over the last four olympics and they've looked at them as a function of the time of the day at the local venue now you've got to assume that um, if you're one of these elite swimmers shown on the right hand side that you've gone to the venue you've gone to athens or tokyo or london or wherever it happens to be way ahead of the event and you're acclimatized so you're on the local time what's interesting is if you look at the the red bars they're the heat which are swum in the morning then you can see that the performances are far worse than either the semi-finals or the finals which are held at night so in swimming at least there is a massive tendency for the best performance does is to happen later in the day so if you're a late phenotype this perhaps plays into your hand but on the other hand you won't be in a final in the evening unless you've swum and qualified for your final in the morning so that poses a massive dilemma for the swimmer then they took all the results from the last four olympics all the heats all the semi-finals and the finals and plotted them again against the time of the day and you can see again that the best performances happened uh, in this if you like window between four o'clock and eight o'clock at night now that's a function of the fact that is that the phenotype or is it the fact that the finals are held at night a very very difficult one to discern there but an interesting study and for the most part i think the most comprehensive analysis of of performances and circadian biology that have been undertaken to date so let's just finish up in the last couple of minutes looking at the few and there are as i stressed before few human studies looking at chrononutrition and training this is one which uh, isn't actually out yet but um, i think is in press and will be uh, published next january i actually obtained this from the authors uh, ahead of press and this is the effect of eight weeks of time restricted feeding in in male middle and long distance runners they were reasonably well trained 60 mils per kilo they're not going to get olympic gold medals with that type of vo2 not in distance running anyway they had eight weeks of time restricted eating in which each individual was allowed to choose the eight hour window in which they ate so some people chose to actually start at perhaps 11 o'clock in the morning uh, and finish at uh, seven or eight o'clock at night whereas others chose to choose that window and break it up to much earlier eating in the evening so the subjects were free based around their training to choose the eight hour window they could choose what they eat when they ate there was no effect on any physiological variable such as the submaximal oxygen cost of running such as performance or anything else the only thing that was different shown on the right hand side here is that the body mass of the subjects decreased with the time restricted eating so even though the subjects were told to eat the same amount of food but just eat it in a different window their body mass was reduced now body mass as i said earlier doesn't tell you the whole story it would have been nice to look at body composition but certainly time restricted feeding for the athletes and at least the studies that have looked at this so far seems to suggest that there's a little bit of weight loss at least in the short term finally the last slide which shows you the effects of energy restricted time restricted eating combined in this case not with endurance activities but with resistance exercise and again just in the interest of time i'll whip through this study fairly quickly the reference is there for you to read but they did four weeks here of a time restricted eating protocol but they were also energy restricted okay so they're time restricted and energy restricted because they were resistance trained subjects they gave them a bucket full of protein almost two grams a day and as you can see on the right hand side here there were very little effects of 
the time-restricted feeding versus the normal dietary protocol. Uh, rest in energy expenditure was the only thing that was reduced. And again, I would put it to you that that's not particularly a good thing. If rest in energy expenditure is reduced, then perhaps lean muscle mass was also reduced. Um, and then again, the measures of strength and performance that they looked at were not significantly different. So energy restricted eating for the athlete, I think, is an area that needs exploring. It's not something that strikes me as being a, a massive thing that athletes would unless they are very interested in, in making weight for a competition, cutting body fat before a competition. Uh, otherwise, the athlete is someone who needs to put back substrates as, as often as they can for the next training session. So time-restricted feeding for the athlete is an area of research which certainly warrants further investigation. But at the moment, I think this is more a tool for uh, individuals who are looking to perhaps improve their health rather than those looking to improve their performance. Again, the last slide, this is a review that we published earlier on in the year, and it was really asking the question, is time-restricted feeding and exercise and training, do they have additive effects? I know I want to merely say from this very, very busy slide is that time-restricted feeding and exercise seem to actually stimulate the same metabolic pathways. And the question there is, if one does this and this does this, are the effects actually additive? They may well be for, for weight loss and health in uh, the normal individual, but as far as the athlete, again, a lot of research needs to be done in this area. So I guess we can finish up there. We are quite welcome to have some questions in the session, and I'll leave that for my talk now, and thank you for listening.